Hi everyone, this is Neil Reiterter, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. This is a follow-up and continuation of a previous case which involved my auntie actually. And if you want to watch the original video, it is number 1235. So you can access that via my YouTube channel, Instagram or Facebook. The video I think was too long for um, TikTok. So uh, feel free to uh, watch the previous episode of this. Now, just to recap, um, my auntie suffered from uh, a middle ear infection called glue ear. And as you can see, she's got a grommet. So she's, she's had previous history of glue ear. Around eight years ago, there or thereabouts, um, she suffered from glue ear. And I'll explain what that is during the course of the video. It's quite a long video, as you can see. It's almost an hour long. So I will kind of explain everything during the course of the video if you stay tuned. And my colleague, Mr. Darius Rajali, who's a superb ENT surgeon, he kindly... Um, inserted grommets in both ears for my auntie to help with the glue in and my auntie's been fine with the grommets now these type of grommets um, in the UK at least they're called the shah grommets they normally fall out by, by themselves um, between six or twelve months and we're hoping during that time the grommets are in that the underlying issue and again I'll explain the underlying issue of glue ear, can resolve itself um, so when the grommets normally fall out they make their own way out of the, the ear and so the ear kind of cleanses itself of the grommet. Um, and actually, that, my auntie still has a grommet, and it's been there for so many years. And there are other types of grommets that can be fitted, which are lifelong or long-term. They're called T-tube grommets or ventilation tubes, I think they're called in America. I've got a couple of clients with those. And they're just designed for um, people who's the underlying cause of the glue ear, it's not really going to resolve or it'll repeat, it'll come back. So it's well worth for them having long term grommets. Now, when you've got grommets, uh, the side effect of having grommets is that you're just more susceptible to infection. You've got an opening into your body. When you've got uh, no hole in your eardrum, then the ear canal is like a cul-de-sac. It's an extension of the outer part of the body. It's not technically inside the body. But as soon as you have a hole in the eardrum, you've, the bacteria, fungi have got access to the inside of your body. And of course, if water gets in your ear, which I always advise people not to get in their ear, in any case, regardless of whether you've got a perforation or not, if water gets through that grommet into the middle ear, it can lead to infection. So uh, my aunt has had no problems for many, many years, but she did accidentally get some water in a, f a couple of months ago. And, she, and this is their left ear. And they suffer from uh, just persistent glue ear now um, what we're doing here at the moment this all this discharge is coming from the middle ear behind the eardrum and um, my auntie has been prescribed some topical ciprofloxacin drops and again I'll explain those in a bit more detail originally she's prescribed oral but that was against the advice of myself and also my colleague the ENT surgeon who I made reference to earlier Mr Rajali who advised the best type of treatment for this is to get some ciprofloxacin drops and instill them through the ear canal so that it enters through the grommet into the middle ear so it's more topical there's a better chance of um, taking control of this infection however my auntie's grommet kept getting blocked because there's fluid coming out of there from the middle ear so what we're trying to do and i saw her on a number of occasions so this is um, technically visit five um, so there were three visits in the previous video number one two three five so visit four was the first, just at the beginning of this video. We cleared that, the grommet, so the discharge. And I was getting my auntie to perform the valve salvage, to close her mouth, pinch her nose and blow. And what that will do is force air up the nose, up the eustachian tube, and force any discharge in the middle out of the grommet. She also used the Otovent nasal boom. We're using that during the procedure. So I'm cleaning the grommet, I'm getting her to... Uh, blow into her nose via the balloon and we can see we're forcing this fluid out and you can see it's just dribbling out of the middle ear through the grommet and collecting and then going back in suctioning all the discharge and just repeating that cycle so it's quite tedious work this video may not be for everyone um so um it, you're basically going to be watching me do this all the time for the next 45 50 minutes so uh, if this is something that kind of video you kind of enjoy, I do apologise and 
feel free to come back when I've got another earwax removal video. But I want to upload this because these are really interesting cases for me and um, uh, my auntie really wants me to upload it as well. And I know a lot of um, clinicians, audiologists will uh, understand, uh, would want to watch stuff like this because it's, it's an uh, issue that we have. Uh, in, we see patients with glue all the time. So it'll just help other professionals to deal with that, uh, the infection and how to kind of overcome its challenges and get on top of the, in the infection and eventually beat it. So again, just cleared the discharge. My auntie closed the mouth, pinched nose, and she was using the balloon actually, so it has the same effect. And we're just forcing the discharge out of the middle ear through the grommet. And some of it was trickling down the throat as well. And once I was comfortable, I got as much discharge out as possible. Um, again, just blowing the nose, forcing, you can see some air bubbles there. So we know when she's closing her mouth, pinching her nose or using the Otovent balloon, there, was, there is air going up the eustachian tube. We've got some air bubbles there and it's trying to force any fluid out. Now, at the original, uh, on the original episode video, one, two, three, five, and at the beginning of this video, you'll see this discharge is quite, um, it's not very viscous, it's quite watery. And as the, uh, the, every visit is kind of two or three days apart, the discharge is getting thicker, it's getting drier. So we know the drops is that it's working and you'll notice the consistency of the discharge changes. Now, what's really, really challenging here is my auntie's got a very narrow ear canal and the grommet um, is positioned on the, what we call the anterior inferior quadrant. So in the left ear, the grommet is essentially south west and in the my auntie's also got a grommet in the right ear and that's, that's inserted at southeast and the reason why the grommets inserted in those positions is because there's nothing behind the eardrum in that region that, that can potentially become damaged by inserting uh, a grommet if, if it was positioned um, southeast then you've got the long process of the incus there um, you've also got the quarter tympani all that's a bit higher up um, but there are structures there um, that potentially can come in contact with grommet. So this region is the best region. But, but my auntie's got a very narrow isthmus, and you can see as the ear canal approaches the eardrum, it narrows, and the grommet is almost tucked in behind the canal wall. It's probably the best way to describe it. It's hidden behind it. So to get access to the, 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 the opening of the grommet, it's really, really challenging because we don't want it to make contact with the ear canal. You can see... The skin is slightly grey, so I'm having no choice but to glide the grommet, uh, the, the suction probe. Um, or I'm trying to avoid actually making any contact, but there is so, unfortunately some contact being made there. You can see the skin is just slightly lifted in that on the approach. Just you can see just at the bottom of the suction probe, the skin there, slightly raised, and that's where I'm right, like right now. I have to make contact with that just to get. Um, access into the hole but was so gentle my auntie it didn't feel a thing and again she's forcing all this discharge out and I've cleaned that grommet you can see it's patent again and once more we're going to repeat the cycle <laughs> so it's closing on that so it's using the otovet nose balloon and at this stage we know like we're clearing a lot of the debris out so it's, you can see a lot of air bubbles there so it's just just a little bit of debris, so we're going to mop that up. And what my auntie would do is, well, I'd put the drops in for her and we'll tilt the head to the side so we know the drops is going inside um, the grommet, entering the middle ear, otherwise the infection's not going to be treated. So I'm just suctioning around the grommet, you can see there's a bit of discharge there. And then my auntie would use the, the prescribed ciprofloxacin drops at home three times a day. And then a couple of days later, it should come back and we'll just repeat this process. Uh, the infection, um, it really did affect her. Um, so when you've got an ear infection like this, or any ear infection really in your ear, unless you've had an ear infection, it's very hard to describe. Um, I mean, I have had an infection before, but not to this severity. And it's, it can really affect your day-to-day -day, um, uh, routine. Typically, it's worse in the mornings, and I'll explain why it is as well. So there's a lot for me to explain, I think, so far. Uh, but I will explain why this is worse at, at night and in the morning. So you wake up, 
with a blocked ear and she was getting discharge every night on her pillow so it's not obviously a nice thing to wake up to the discharge can be quite smelly as well it can be a, a, a kind of a, lot, a bit of an offensive foul odor to it so again um, of course if we're having that coming out of rose we're not going to be happy um, and she can't hear from this side it's painful at times and you just feel lopsided you just feel heavy on one side of your head um, because you've got fluid behind the eardrum um, what I'm doing here, I'm just trying to mop up around the entrance. Is of, um, as I mentioned at night, it was weeping, so some of the, the discharge would crystallise, um, in the outside part of her ear. So this is visit six now, and it was a couple of days later, and you can see there's a bit of discharge there. So once more, we're going to mop up now. You may be able to begin to see um, on the peripheral part the ear canal there's white flaking of skin and that's just a normal residue that occurs when you use these particular drops i've got and I, i'll just come back to that so i've got my auntie to, to use the balloon you can see she's forced out this th really thick discharge it's getting thicker than previous occasions that could mean two things however it could mean that the infection is getting worse when you've got fluid behind the eardrum normally it's it's quite watery and as the infection develops it becomes thicker becomes more viscous Hence the term glue, because that fluid eventually turns like glue. It's very thick, viscous and sticky. So it could be that the infection is worsening. Uh, on the other hand, however, it could be that because we, the, the drops is getting through the grommet, it's drying up the ear. And you can see the outer part of the ear canal has become drier because of the drops. Um, that they're using ciprofloxacin has this effect. And I've got a, another client, and I know they're going to be watching this because they tend on a monthly basis. They have a grommet as well. They've got a tea chew, a long, uh, a long term grommet, and their situation is slightly different. They occasionally get an infection, but not not as severe as this. Their main issue is that their ear becomes very itchy, and the reason why the ear becomes itchy is because dead skin that dies and sheds on the eardrum. It's not migrating away from the eardrum. And that's because the dead skin is attaching itself to the grommet. So this patient has to come in almost every month to have this dead skin delicately peeled off the eardrum and the side walls of the ear canal. So it's quite a, a delicate procedure. And um, they sometimes, when they do get an infection like this, they use the same drops of fluflaxin. And I, I'll explain why, again, they're having to use this, this particular type of drops. Um, and they don't like using it because their ear canal comes like this it becomes very dry and flaky and th th that particular patient can feel it and um, so they try and avoid using that wherever possible but sometimes there's no alternative and we have to kind of remove as much as we can now this white residue you'll see in the next few visits becomes more and more it's very hard to remove and technically speaking you don't have to remove it it's just a natural byproduct of the, the drops that they, that'll flake away um it's just dried skin and these medications all try and dry the ear canal because it's when the ear is moist and damp and wet that you're more likely to develop an ear infection. You can imagine you've got a dark, warm, moist environment. It's the perfect breeding ground incubator for bacteria and fungi. So the drops all have drying um, ingredients, mechanisms, active ingredients that dry the ear. But the last visit, we do try and remove a bit and... Um, without spoiling the whole video by the end the infection is resolved she just had some dry skin i did try and remove as much as i could possible um and we are due to see her in the next week hopefully because i know she's going on holiday um just so everything's fine before she goes and there's any skin i suspect there will not be any dry skin left i will do an, a follow-up video i suspect the ear canal will be completely uh, free of all the debris um because that flaky dry skin would migrate by itself out of the ear and fall off so as you're watching this it's just going to be again um got another half an hour of this if this is not your cup of tea i do apologize um, but it, from an audiological perspective from my perspective these are actually the more challenging cases whenever you go deep in the ear and the grommet um and when you can see there's highly little space to work for it's a test of my skills so i actually really enjoy doing these procedures and they're very, very, very challenging. Uh, I would no way be able to do this when I first started. My auntie would have had to gone elsewhere. Um, again, you can see I'm just getting her to blow her nose uh, with the balloon, just forcing more fluid out. I'm going to suction it out before putting the drops in. So what is glue here? 
glue ear, uh, or let me just make be more generic at first, and I'll come down to glue ear. Um, when you've got an infection of the middle ear, we call it otitis media. Otitis is Latin for ear infection. Media means the middle ear. If you've got an infection of the outer ear, that is termed otitis externa. So otitis again, ear infection, external is a location, um, external ear, so the ear canal. Um, you can get otitis in, in turn. So I'll come back to that. This is episode seven. So you can see uh, there's not as much discharge there uh, as previous visits, but it's, it is a lot thicker. It has collected there. My, uh, my auntie reported no weeping out of her. So although well, there's a bit of discharge collecting, it's not weeping out at night anymore, which is great. And as I made reference to, you can see all that white debris. That's not fungal infection. That's not infection. That is just... Um, the drops, that's what happens. It just, you get this dryness of the ear canal and the skin kind of flakes away the outer layer. So that's all, that's all good. That we're happy with that. That's what it should look like. Um, and you can see this let it's thicker. It's, it's not coming out as, uh, as well now because it's thicker and it's more viscous. It's hard to kind of force out through the grommet. So otitis interna, but that's an infection of the inner ear. We don't, but rarely seldom use that term. I think when it's an infection of the uh, inner ear, that some more of the specific terms are given. So for example, labyrinthitis, vestibular neuritis. Now at that moment, uh, my auntie kind of, um, she did find it slightly uncomfortable. Um, so you can see it came away suddenly. Or was it? I'm not sure if you did try and come to I think it was just the noise actually. Um, one or the other, but you can see that sudden movement and that's where you've got to be alert. Uh, whenever we're performing clinical ear care, we've got to be alert uh, because all, I've got a brace, which is useful. So any sudden movements, it can control that head movements. We don't want to, I don't want to, although my aunt has technically got a hole in the eardrum by the grommet, I don't want to add another hole with the instrument and cause another infection. So we've always, always got to be prepared to come away with the instrumentation or if we're not able to do that, support the patient's head. So if they do move, it's not going to come in contact with the instrument. Because these instruments are kind of quite sharp. Um, it's, a, it's a needle in the ear. That's essentially what it is. These are stainless steel needles that we're putting in the ear that are hollow. So, um, yeah, otitis interna, the, the, uh, the, it's normally within the audiological profession, ENT um, field, the term's more, when it's describing an inner ear infection, it's more of the specific type of infection, so labyrinthitis, vestibular neuritis, many ears disease. Um, if there's a, a lesion, so an acoustic neuroma, so there's more specific terms given. Now, otitis media, going back to that, that's an umbrella term, and it encompasses many infections of the middle ear. But you can get um, different names, uh, more specific terms given for different types of infection. For example... One of the middle ear infections, you can call it, it's called um, superative otitis um, media. So chronic superative otitis media. And that's when you've got a middle ear infection and there's a hole in your eardrum, like a perforation. So technically speaking, you could argue that the infection that my auntie's got is called chronic superative otitis media because although she has got an artificial hole, she's got a grommet. Um, I'll come back to that. You can see now that I've got that thicker discharge. It's a lot drier. So, but this has caused its own problem because some of the discharge is crystallized and it's blocking that grommet. And I'm testing that. And the reason, how I'm testing it, I'm using a tympanometer machine, which is a, a pressure test machine. We can measure the mobility of the, of the middle ear. But what the tympanometer can also do is measure the ear canal volume. Now, when you haven't got a hole in your eardrum or you've got no grommet, the ear canal volume is from the entrance of the ear, where the, the little we have a little rubber tip that goes into here, from the starting point of that to the eardrum. But when you've got a hole in the eardrum and you measure the ear canal volume, not only are you measuring the ear canal volume of the outer ear, but you're also measuring the ear canal volume of the middle ear. So you should have a much, much larger, almost two or three times larger ear canal volume. And I'm continuously testing that during the appointment, whenever I think the grommet's clear, I'm testing the, uh, measuring the ear canal volume. And if it's a normal ear canal volume, what you should get when there's no hole, we know the grommet's blocked. Or well, there's still a lot of fluid behind the eardrum, so we're not able to physically measure the whole volume because of the fluid that remains in the middle ear or the grommet's blocked. And 
in this case, there's a lot of dry debris you can see, and this is much harder to remove than the liquid because the, the liquid it, it's, it, it's more susceptible to be suctioned. So, carry on watching that, and I'll explain about the uh, again. Uh, I'm going off course a few times. Uh, about otitis media, so chronic superative otitis media is when you've got a middle ear infection, and these infections normally in, uh, involve mucoidal uh, discharge, so essentially uh, watery discharge, mucoidal is a more thicker type of discharge that originates from the middle ear uh, or the upper respiratory tracts in the back of the nose that connects to the middle ear by the eustachian tube. Then you can get um, a simple middle ear infusion. So middle ear infusion is when you've just got a bit of fluid build up behind the eardrum. Um, it's, it's less likely to be thicker. It's more watery. It's at the early stages of um, glue ear. Um, then you can just get acute otitis media. That's when you may not necessarily have any fluid behind the eardrum, but you will have... Um, inflammation of the, the skin that lines the middle ear and the inner membrane of the eardrum, and that's a, mu a mucosa membrane. So mucosal skin is similar to the skin that we have it lines the inside of our nose. Slightly different type of mucosal skin in the, in the middle ear, but similar concept. So they're secretory, they secrete fluid naturally. Whereas the skin that lines the ear canal, that's not mucosa skin, this is epidermis skin. Uh, made up of epithelial skin cells. It's a different skin that lines the ear canal in comparison to the skin that lines the middle ear. So acute otitis media is when you get inflammation of the mucosal membrane that lines the middle ear and the innermost layer of the eardrum. And you can get um, otitis media with effusion, so you can have uh, inflammation and discharge. Uh, and that kind of almost overlaps with glue ear, so acute otitis media with effusion. So some of these terms are used interchangeably, um, and they're, they're not often used in that, in that way, um, but it just helps clarify what type of middle ear infection and what stage the middle ear infection is. So, um, so what's glue ear? Now, uh, I'll explain the mechanics, the biology, uh, the physiology of it. So... Um, the middle ear, so the cavity behind the eardrum should be air-filled and the air pressure behind the eardrum should be equal um, to the air, or thereabouts, to the air pressure in the environment, say in the ear canal. When the air pressure is equal either side of the eardrum, that's when we hear the best, that's when the eardrum is most mobile. So what regulates the air pressure in the middle ear is a narrow tube called the eustachian tube and that connects the middle ear to the back of the nose. And the eustachian tube at normal resting state is closed. And the reason why it's closed is that it prevents infections that you may have in the upper respiratory tract traveling up through the eustachian tube and infecting the, the middle ear cavity. So it's closed for a reason and it's also closed because it, it, it inhibits you from hearing your internal sounds. So, or internal sounds louder, should I say as well. For example, uh, your own voice. So if the eustachian tube was permanently open, you'll hear your voice twice. When you speak, your voice gets projected into the, the surrounding space around you and it will enter your ear canal. And it also enters up your nose because the nose is an opening just like your ear canal is. And the sound will hit the outer part of the eardrum. So if the sound's coming through your ear canal, it's going to hit the eardrum from this direction to your eardrum and stimulate sound. And if it's coming up your nose and up the eustachian tube, if it's permanently open, it's going to hit the inside of your eardrum. But either way, it's going to cause your eardrum to vibrate both sides. And because of the time differences, time, it'd be a bit quicker for the sound to travel up your nose compared to your ear to reach your ear canal. Um, they're out of sync. So a lot of people whose eustachian tube is permanently open, we call that patulous eustachian tube, they find that their own voice is muffled um, and it's blocked. So they're hearing themselves twice, out of phase. And yeah, it's, um, it's not a nice sensation because you, you, your voice doesn't sound right. We also hear ourselves through bone conduction. So we have vibrations of the skull, um, which also stimulate the organ of hearing. So... Um, your session tube should be normally closed, and it's also normally closed so we don't hear inter inter our internal kind of pulses and heartbeats, example. Um, so it just prevents sounds from travelling up your station tube and stimulating the injury from the inside. 
But the eustachian tube should open um, by itself, involuntarily, without us even realising when we swallow, you will not chew. So there's muscles either side of the eustachian tube that connect to the back of the nose. So that's the cartilage portion of the eustachian tube. Um, as the eustachian tube travels up towards the middle ear, it becomes, turns into bone. So the muscles either side of the eustachian tube opening, they, they contract and it causes the eustachian tube to momentarily open. And during that moment of opening, the air pressure can equalise. So if you've got too much air behind your eardrum uh, in compared to the uh, environment, so if that's positive middle ear pressure, the, the air will escape. But if there's not enough, which is normally the case, uh, air will enter up your nose, up the eustachian tube and fill up the middle ear. And so it's equal to the air pressure in the atmosphere. So the eustachian tube's main function is uh, the pressure equalizing tube. It tries to keep the air pressure at equilibrium in the middle ear in comparison to the outer ear. Now, the eustachian tube also has a second purpose. So any fluid that accumulates in the middle ear, because I said this is a secretory membrane, mucosal membrane, it can drain out of the eustachian tube when it opens so it doesn't collect. Because if you've got fluid behind the eardrum, the eardrum's not going to vibrate as much because of the the the, uh, the fluid's got a higher density than air, so it's not going to allow the eardrum to vibrate. Um, it can and obviously it can lead to an infection. So it has two purposes. Um, now for some people, the eustachian tube doesn't open as it should. Now several reasons. It could be a, a congenital or acquired uh, anatomical defect. The eustachian tube is just very narrow. So it's just very difficult for it to open. Or the muscles have become paralysed so they don't contract. Or there's obstruction at the back of the nose, for example, a polyp. Or loads of inflammation, so sinitis or rhinitis, uh, enlarged turbinates, for example. Uh, deviated septums, potentially, as well. So there could be a physical obstruction there or inflammation or mucus there. And that prevents the eustachian tube from opening. Or if it does open, it doesn't allow air to travel up it because the mucus that's or inflammation that's lining the entrance. So when the eustachian tube doesn't open as intended, there's a shortage of air behind the middle ear and any remaining air in the middle ear gets absorbed by the cells in the middle ear, by the mucosal membrane, because they're all full of um, uh, skin cells and the, the oxygen, the air gets absorbed. And during that process, um, moisture is forced out of the cells. Uh, as, as the oxygen is getting absorbed by the skin cells, fluid within the cells gets forced out. So it collects in the middle ear. It can't drain because that eustachian tube is blocked. The mucosal membrane also secretes its natural fluid. So you get accumulation of fluid and this fluid can't escape because it's trapped. So then this fluid, it, it starts off quite watery. Then it if the eustachian tube doesn't spontaneously or through medication or other treatments resolve, the fluid builds up and it can fill up the whole middle ear and eventually that fluid can, it just gets infected, it becomes more viscous, it becomes thicker and stickier like glue, hence the term glue ear. And just like a water balloon, it's only so much water a water balloon can take before it bursts and in the same way, if there's too much fluid and glue air behind the eardrum, um, something's going to have to give. And quite often you can get a perforation. The, the eardrum pops because there's too much fluid and that fluid just eases out. Um, it can be a painful initially when you've got uh, when your eardrum pops, that moment it pops, it can be quite painful. But uh, afterwards, it can inadvertently give you a bit of relief because a hole in your eardrum is almost like a grommet. It's going to allow the fluid to that pressure is no longer there, fluid's weeping out. So, and I'll just come back to that in a moment. You can see we spent on this particular visit, I think this is visit seven, it was actually more difficult because you can just see how dry that debris is. Um, it's much more difficult to remove that. And that's completely blocked. So this grommet's blocked. My, my auntie uh, can feel it's blocked. Although overall her symptoms have improved because there's less fluid behind the middle ear, but she can feel this grommet to be blocked. I'm doing the pressure test. Um, it's blocked. If we put the drops in, it's not going to get through this gr um, grommet because, or it might do eventually, it might wash it away, but I need to clear this grommet so we can treat the infection, we can put the the drops through. So, and that's why it's such a tedious procedure. We could have just left this, but if I left this as it is, 
the likelihood is that my auntie, when she puts the ciprofloxacin in, drops into the ear, it won't enter the grommet and the infection's still active and it's not being treated and we're back to square one again. So I'm just spending loads of time here. Uh, I used to put my auntie in at the end of the clinic um, so I've got no other patients because I knew it's going to take a long time to, to, to perform these little procedures. My patient is here for about an hour um, whilst we're trying to clean all this and then putting the drops in for her. So um, now uh, my colleague, Mr. Rajali, ENT surgeon, who I made reference to earlier, he's the one that fits the grommets for my auntie. Um, a few years back, and he probably doesn't remember, but he came, he's a very intelligent uh, individual. He's, he's like my mentor, so I look up to him, learn loads from him and continue to do so. But he said sometimes uh, these bacteria that's causing the, the glue ear, when you've got an infection in the middle ear, they kind of wisen up. They realise if, if they have too much fluid and too much fluid leads to the rupture of the eardrum and the bacteria then escapes, that the, the, sometimes the infection can heal itself because air can get in and uh, help to fight the infection. Um, then the, the, the bacteria is not even collected together. So it, some say it could be possible for this bacteria to evolve almost, so it kind of knows not to over-secrete. Because um, obviously another reason why you get fluid buildup is when you've got the bacteria in the ear. So you get three reasons. As the air, in, when the eustachian tube is blocked and you've got air there, that gets absorbed by the skin cells in the middle ear. And that kind of process forces fluid out into the middle ear. The, the mucosal membrane, by default, there's a secretory membrane, so that will secrete a fluid. But also, when, when there's bacteria uh, in the ear, or fungi as well, as they're breeding, reproducing, they also exclude discharge. So um, the bacteria themselves have actually learned not to over-secrete um, fluid because if they do, they don't almost want the eardrum to be perforated because it allows them to continue to colonise and incubate the middle ear. But by rupturing the eardrum, then they can no longer colonise the middle ear because you know, the, the bacteria escapes through when the discharge weeps out of the ear. So, um, yeah, if it doesn't resolve, you get lead to a perforation. So how do you treat glue ear? Now, the, the, the NICE guidelines in the UK um, suggest that it's a watch and wait policy. So sometimes try not to do anything because um, if you over prescribe antibiotics, as we all know, you know we can be, uh, become immune to it. Um, bacteria can become resistant to the antibacteria and long term, it's probably not to everyone's best um, uh, kind of wishes if we overuse back, uh, antibiotics. Uh, and antibiotics may not always work, it may not be the root cause. So a watch and wait policy is recommended, but it's not a nice feeling having this in your ear. So um, and this is normally worse at night. So I said I'm going to explain why it's worse at night. So when we lay down horizontally, and because of our circadian rhythms, um, the blood vessels in the back of our nose, it goes through cycles um, where it kind of dilates and constricts. And at night, uh, quite often, it, it dilates more. So when you've got dilation of the blood vessels around the eustachian tube, it's naturally going to cause more, just a bit more inflammation because the blood vessels are more dilated. So it's more uh, of a constriction of the, the, the internal diameter of the eustachian tube. Essentially, the eustachian tube becomes more blocked at night when you're horizontal and you're sleeping because of our circadian rhythms. So quite often in the morning, and I've had this before and it's really bad in the mornings for me, I can just feel fluid in my ear. Um, and then um, during the course of the morning, as you're swallowing and having something to eat and you're moving your jaw, hopefully the eustachian tube, even if, you know, if only a little bit, some of the fluid drains away and then when you go for a shower and all the steam that really helps because you inhale that steam and it helps to um it helps to i'm just trying to think we're still on the same visit i think yeah it helps to clear the nasal passages but then half an hour later as i get into work it's blocked again so it's a short term fix there now i think i might have just missed one of the visits here but i'm not sure but um still got about 20 minutes to go so um, keep watching, guys, if you're finding this interesting and also the explanation. Um, so one of the short-term treatments of uh, glue ear is steam in inhalation. So if you get a hot, uh, you get a bowl with a hot water, menthol crystals, eucalyptus drops, tile over your head, inhale that steam, and that steam will help clear your nasal passages. Hopefully, help to possibly unblock the eustachian tube, so air can travel up the eustachian tube, pop the eardrum back out, and allow fluid to drain. Um, 
the, all these mental sticks as well. So you can try those. You can get them over the counter. So it's like a tube. You insert up your nose and inhale whilst blocking the other nostril. That can give some short-term re relief. Sucking on hard-boiled sweets, for example, that stimulates movement of your jaw. And it's your jaw movement that sometimes can help the muscles contract. Back of the eustachian tube to open. Um, nasal decongestions, you can get steroid-based ones or saline-based ones. Most steroid-based ones, it's um, children above the age of 12 only. Um, so they'll have to use um, saline versions or other types that are suitable for children. With steroid nasal spray uh, or drops, you can only use them for a week, uh, I think something up to 10 days. And that's because if you overuse them, uh, your nose in a way becomes dependent upon it. And when you stop using it, the blood vessels can dilate. So nasal decongestants are good if the cause of the blockage of the eustachian tube is inflammation at the back of the nose, so the blood vessels are dilated. So nasal decongestants, um, antihistamines as well, they can help constrict the blood vessels. So there's kind of less blood around the back of the nose with the eustachian tube, so there's less, so the eustachian tube can open and there's less uh, pressure in, in the internal diameter. Um, but if you overuse steroid nasal drops or spray, when you stop using it, the blood vessel spontaneously, it's not fully understood the mechanism, it spontaneously dilates again. So it has the opposite effect. We call that nasal rebound, so you can't overuse them. So that's really important. Um, uh, you can use uh, uh, um, saline nasal spray to salt water. Um, so uh, that helps the osmosis. So by introducing salt water uh, so into the back of the nose. Uh, so the water potential travels from uh, a negative to a more negative. So the water potential, if there's swelling there, so there's a, if there's edema, inflammation at the back of the nose, the, the fluid in the cells causing the inflammation will be drawn out because of the salt water in the nose to dilute it. So because it always travels from a, a water from a, if I'm correct, I think osmosis is different to diffusion. The water potential, it's all minus, so zero is pure water. And that always travels to a more negative water potential. And the more negative water potential is when you've got um, less pure water. So if you've got salt water. So that is something, I apologise if I got that wrong. It's been a long time since I um, studied biology. But I think I'm possibly right, but... If I'm wrong, I, I'm, I, well, I may be wrong now that I'm thinking about it. Um, but essentially, it's like uh, it's osmosis, it's like diffusion. Water gets drawn out um, because of salt water into the nose. It tries to um, diffuse it, dilute it. So that can help because it reduces the swelling at the back of your nose. So these are all kind of treatments you can try. Then you can try uh, the ear popper or otovent nasal balloon. So the Otovent nasal balloon, it's a balloon that you try inflating using your nose. Um, it, so it's a device with a nasal capsule, a rounded tip with a hollow center. You position that at the entrance of the nose. On the opposite end, you attach the balloon and you just blow into the balloon by uh, blocking, closing up the opposite nostril with your finger and then blowing into the balloon using your nose. And as the balloon inflates the size of an orange, for example, you can swallow and what this does, it tries to force open at eustachian tube, force air up it to widen it so fluid can drain and air can enter and pop your eardrum back out. So that's uh, one thing you can try as well. Or the ear poppers when you get some mechanical device, you put it up your nose, close the other nostril, press a button and it uh, mechanically pumps air up your nose. Um, so you can and swallow it, you swallow at the same time, try and force up the eustachian tube to widen it so fluid can drain it's a block drain pipe essentially if that doesn't work then there's surgical treatments so a grommet so like what my auntie's got so what a grommet does uh, the surgeon there's dust dust done by an ent surgeon uh, they make an incision into the eardrum using a scalpel uh, where the grommet is and then they suction the fluid out so they can make a kind of a not a too big a hole but a nice a nice size hole to um, suction out the fluid and to prevent the fluid from building up again and to allow air to enter the middle ear because it can't via the eustachian tube. So when you put a grommet in, it's not fixing the eustachian tube. That's important to, to point out. Well, not directly anyway. 
And so the grommet provides an alternative route for air to enter the middle ear. So the air pressure is equal behind the eardrum compared to the atmosphere and it can allow and that will naturally stop fluid from building up because if there's a shortage of air, any remaining air in the middle ear gets absorbed by the skin cells and that forces fluid out. So by having air in the middle ear, you're going to have less likely fluid building up by virtue of that fact. And also, if there is any fluid that builds up, it can kind of drain out of the, the grommet. So it's giving the ear the best chance. And grommets, as I said earlier, they're short. Some of these, these typically only last six to 12 months. Um, and we're hoping during that time, whatever's blocking the eustachian tube resolves itself. So by the time the grommet falls out, so you can think about the grommet like a temporary bypass for air to enter the middle ear and fluid to escape. Um, so other treatments are long-term grommets. So for patients who are just a chronic problem, the eustachian tube never resolve itself. You can have long-term grommets for life. And in a way, this has ended up being long-term grommets for my auntie. And because they haven't caused her an issue, and um, f- just say, and I, for my auntie, it may have been that the fact that she got water in there triggered this. So that's one of the negatives of a grommet. But just say it wasn't, and the, the middle ear infection happened for another reason. The grommet's actually helped us because it's allowed me to, to, to suction the fluid out. Otherwise, you know, it should have been so much pain and it would take longer to resolve um, because you'd have to use oral antibiotics, which are not probably going to be as effective as the ciprofloxacin and eardrops that penetrate the middle ear directly. So for that reason, we're going to continue with the grommets. Um, but if it's the grommet, sometimes grommets can cause an infection as well. So Because as I said, it exposes the middle ear to um, airborne pathogens. So these can enter the grommets. So it's, everything kind of swings around and around about. So there's a fine line. Um, you're going to just do what's right for the patient and sometimes they work sometimes they don't and it's very hard to predict for those that will and won't but grommets can really really help people and they really can but for some people they can cause side effects i know patients have had to have grommets removed because as soon as they've had the grommet they were got infected and they couldn't tolerate the grommet and they've had to go straight back in to have the grommet removed they just didn't want it afterwards so but my aunt has gotten really really well another treatment is eustachian tube balloon dilation if you've got a, a narrow eustachian tube a balloon is inserted, it's normally done under general anaesthetic, but I do know some ENT surgeons that do it um, using local anaesthetic whilst the patient's awake. Basically, a balloon, balloon, this is simplifying it, but a balloon is inserted up the eustachian tube, injected with saline to s- stretch the balloon, and it's kind of in the eustachian tube, I think around 30 seconds, and it's it's designed to compress against the dead skin, uh, to compress against the skin, that lining uh, the eustachian tubes. If that's inflamed or there's bacteria there, it kind of almost kills it and it stretches the eustachian tube mechanically as well. It forces it open and once that skin regrows, hopefully there's less inflammation on there um, or there's less, um, this kind of almost makes the same skin thicker. I forgot the exact physiology of that, but I know a eustachian tube balloon dilation, it does something to the skin um, and once that skin almost reheals, it's ho- they're hoping that um, it's less inflamed or it's less thicker in some way so the eustachian tube is more painted it's got a, a larger internal diameter and the balloon of course can mechanically stretch the eustachian tube because that part is made up of cartilage hence why you can stretch it if you put the balloon on the bony part of the ear well it's not really going to do much but the eustachian tube normally gets blocked at the back of the nose sorry for these little moments i forgot to edit those out so again going back to the videos i've not talked about it for a while on to use the balloon, we keep adding it, just blowing the nose, forcing this fluid out. It's getting drier and drier and drier, this um, fluid is becoming more viscous. Um, we did a hearing test, I think, at this appointment, and the hearing had significantly improved. The ear canal cavity, the volume measured by the pressure test and penometer was enlarging, so that was all working to our favour. So I kind of knew that the reason why it's getting thicker wasn't because the infection was getting worse, but because the drops have been penetrating through the grommet, drying up the middle ear, like it's drying up the ear canal. You can see the ear canal is dry. So if the drops are going to go in the middle ear, it's going to dry up the middle ear so the fluid becomes drier. And that's why you know it's it's blocking this. But I still want to we still want to clear these grommets. Um, I still needed to use the drops for a few more days, so I need to get this clean. 
as best as we can so the drops can penetrate so yet yeah, eustachian tube balloon dilation can stretch the eustachian tube um, so if you are born with an anatomical narrow eustachian tube or for some reason it's narrowed over the years it can help with that so there are some of the treatments available for glue ear and eustachian tube dysfunction um, so this is the final no i don't think it is the final visit i think second but final visit you can see there's a bit of discharge there or it could have been because that was quite um quite a thick discharge i just put some ciprofloxacin in drops in and i think that's what i did i just put some drops in just to, to loosen it a little bit to make it a bit yes so this is the same visit still because that was really thick um discharge because it's dried up i just put a bit of drops just to loosen it a little bit and this is ciprofloxacin in drops now ciprofloxacin in drops are safe to use with a hole in the eardrum that's why uh, that my auntie has to use this and that's why the other client i have who sometimes has to use it when they've got a grommet they can't use your normal antibiotic ear drops or spray because they majority of them are what we call ototoxic they contain an, a, a, an antibiotic an amino glycoside ending in mycin so neomycin streptomycin uh, gentamicin for example and they're known to be, be ototoxic if they enter the middle ear and if they get absorbed by the inner ear they can damage the inner ear and cause a permanent hearing loss so it's not advised wherever possible not to prescribe that for patients with a hole in the eardrum or grommets now sometimes the ENT surgeons have to because to get on top of the infection they have to do something so you just got to weigh out the pros and cons and sometimes it's just better for them because if they don't resolve the infection the infection is going to cause trauma uh, and cause more issues now what's good here, I can feel, when I'm touching the grommet, you're going to see the eardrum move a bit. I can feel that there's less pressure before I could feel the fluid. You can see the eardrum's moving a little bit, which is good. It's it's become mobile, the fluid. I know, I, so that's a telltale sign for me that there's less fluid in the middle ear because I can't, I'm not pushing against fluid anymore. The ear, so Because there's air there, the eardrum's moving more freer. So that's, I'm really pleased with that. I think we just got one more visit. So... This is the the tenth visit, I think, overall. So, yes, your station chip completely. Um, it's what, it seems like it's uh, resolved itself. Um, sorry, did I say your station chip? The grommet is not blocked anymore. You can see straight through it. There's no discharge whatsoever. I think my auntie had one or two days left of the drops, so she's going to finish that off. And I just want to see if I can peel away some of this debris now. Uh, so to my auntie, I'm not too concerned by this. It will flake away, but I've just put some, we had to put some drops in anyway as part of the treatment. So I just put some drops in just to see if I can soften this, but counterproductively, it's going to be putting the drops in, it's going to come back. So I explained to my auntie, I'll just remove some. And so there's less to remove next time um, if we do need to. But this is the last visit, it's the last time I've seen my auntie's ear. So I'm just going to be peeling away. This is really hard stuff to peel because you're, you're, you're making contact with the canal wall and you can graze it so just be really gentle don't want to be silly here and I left a lot behind there's some bits where I just didn't feel like it's going to peel away it's the debris it's too tightly adhered but I did as much as I can so but the grommet's cleared now uh, the infection's more or less resolved but the party is going to use uh, was to use the drops for the remaining couple of days. So yes, the ciprofloxacin in there, non-ototoxic, they're safe to use when you've got a hole in the eardrum, they're very effective uh, with bacterial infections. See, I'm just peeling that away. For anyone that's still watching from the beginning, well done to you, you've done well. Um, I, I don't suspect, I think there'd be probably a high dropout rate. I don't think, I can understand as well, people don't want to watch earwax removal videos, um, and this is not earwax removal, so, I won't take it offensively, but at the same time, for those that do enjoy these type of videos and kind of appreciate the and, and enjoy, not appreciate is probably the wrong word, but enjoy the narration, a, an explanation of the middle ear, or someone has grommets themselves who suffer some chronic ear infections, hopefully this has been useful for you. So, and that's the reason for the channel. Um, of course, we mainly do earwax removal, 
but quite often I'm doing loads more ear infections in complex cases like these. And this, I would say this is a complex case, going up to someone's grommet in the way that we have. And when the grommet's located behind, almost hidden away from the, uh, the isthmus, the narrowing of the ear canal, so the interior, inferior recess, the, the bony part of the ear canal, preventing access, direct access to the centre of the grommet where the hole is for me to use the circus hip. I would say it's a very complex case. And it's made a big, big difference to my auntie's quality of life. Um, she was just worried that this is not going to clear. And you, know, you think worst case scenario is what, what happens now, so this doesn't resolve. But fortunately, we got top of, on top of it. And at this last appointment, when I did the pressure test, the ear canal volume was um, double almost three times the normal uh, average ear canal volume of, of, of humans, which tells us that the grommet is um, not blocked and the middle ear is free of fluid. Because if you had fluid in the middle ear, just say the grommet was unblocked, but there's fluid in the middle ear. When you do the tympanometry test and measure the ear canal volume, it's still not going to measure the volume of the, of the middle ear because of the fluid. So the fact that the ear canal volume is almost back to normal, if not back to normal, we know by, by, by virtue that there's no fluid in the middle ear because we're, we're now able to measure the, the increased volume of the middle ear and ear canal in the absence of the fluid, which we wouldn't be able to do if there's fluid there. So on the posterior medial canal wall, this is probably for me the most sensitive part of the ear canal. And again, this is not fungal infection in case anyone thinks this is um, fungal infection. Now, sometimes when you use antibiotics, you overuse them or and sometimes you know, it has to be done because to fight the bacterial infection. Fungi can take advantage because it's got less, competi less competition because antibiotics is not going to kill the fungus or fungi will stop it from reproducing. So when there's less bacteria, even healthy bacteria, because we've got loads of healthy bacteria in the ear, which is good for us, uh, but antibiotics can also affect healthy um, bacteria, which then means there's less competition for the fungi. Which So quite often patients can develop a fungal infection secondary to a bacterial infection. But this is not fungus, I can assure you. In fact, there was an ENT colleague in America. I'll see if I can find them on LinkedIn because they uploaded a great video the other day of a case, I think, when someone used a cotton bud and perforated the eardrum and they had like a granuloma growing, so granulation tissue, through the hole. So it was difficult to visualise whether there was a hole because where the hole was, you had... Um, um, granulation tissue or in inflammatory tissue so the ENT surgeon got the patient to do the valsalva so it closed the mouth pinch nose and below and you could actually see a bit of fluid coming out around the granuloma and you could hear air so they kind of that, that was a telltale sign that there's a hole in the eardrum so similarly the ENT surgeon prescribed um, a variation of ciprofloxacin drops so safe to use in, in, in an ear with a perforation and at the follow-up case the the ENT surgeon put up um, a video and you could see the eardrum had healed but also you can see all this residue because it's a similar type of drops all this dry skin I'm just trying to see if I can find them online I probably won't be able to do it at the moment so that was reassuring for me to know that there's nothing to worry about with this. It will just flake away. But my auntie didn't really feel it was itchy, but my other client who uses this drops now and again really can find it itchy. So again, everyone's different. Everyone reacts differently to the medications that are prescribed to them. So I've made pretty good progress, probably a bit more than I thought I would be able to remove, but I think we're nearing the end now so there's some bits on the eardrum I don't want to mess around in that that deep in the ear and you've got the roof of the ear canal which is very hard to get access to so I'm just gonna do a little bit more at the bottom I think my hand is probably a bit tired as well so 
So I'm just always lifting upwards so as to not scrape the canal wall. So it's looking back to how it should be. The, the yellowy white patches either side, that's just tympanous growth. It's both sides of the grommet. They had that before, that's just tympanous growth. If you watch back my earlier video that I advised that, I'm going to put the link in the description and explain all that. Well, take care, guys. Speak soon. Bye.